Did you know microplastics, which are basically tiny pieces of plastic, are intentionally used in some conventional fertilizers, pesticides, and other agricultural products to make them more effective? There must be a more sustainable way to grow our food, and today we're talking to a company that has a better solution. I'm Daniel Hartz, and this is the Sustainability Champions podcast, where we highlight the people, ideas, and innovations that are protecting and healing the planet. Today, my guest is Sean Smith, CEO of Eden Research, which is based near Oxford in the UK. And Eden Research is the only public company in the UK that focuses on biopesticides in order to help produce agriculture more sustainably. Their plastic-free products and technologies protect high-value fruits and vegetables using natural chemicals that are found in other plants. And it's a more sustainable alternative to conventional chemical-based crop protection products. So thank you so much for joining me, Sean. Really glad to have you on the show. Thanks, Daniel. It's great to be here. And where are you taking the call from, by the way? Uh, I'm taking it from my makeshift office in my house, which happens to be a uh, spare bedroom. So uh, I, I live in, in Bath in England, so uh, about 90 minutes or so from, from London. Yeah, well, Bath is, is beautiful. And I think we're all working in our makeshift offices and have been doing for quite some time now. And uh, yeah, I think who knows where we'll be working in the next few months. Hard you to are, indeed, indeed. It, it's difficult to predict. And um, you know, I guess it's fortunate that we have things like Zoom and other technologies that allow us to do that reasonably effectively. Indeed. So uh, today, uh, speaking of conversation uh, across different, uh, across the country, um, I'd like to discuss three things really. Number one is why in the world are microplastics used in agriculture in the first place? Second of all, I'm I'm really interested in hearing about Eden's natural solutions um, to protecting crops and as you call it, the chemistry that you use. And then finally, your background and how you got into this space in the first place. So briefly, just to give us a bit of context, what does Eden Research do? Thanks, um, good question. Yeah, the, the focus of our business is on developing products um, to address significant problems in uh, agriculture, but also in animal health and in the consumer products areas, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, the focus of all of our product development efforts is really very much around sustainable chemistry. In other words, solving the problems that, that um, people, uh, farmers, etc., have using uh, an approach which is um, not harmful for the planet, not harmful for the ecosystem or the people that are using those products. Yeah, fantastic. And how did you get started uh, at Eden? Because you've, you've had a, a background that's sort of, uh, you moved into Eden uh, relatively recently, I would say. Um, Coming up on about six years ago, you know, it's a good question. Um, I've spent most of my career in the chemical industry, um, mm -hmm. despite my, my very best efforts to leave multiple times, um, which might sound a bit funny, but I, I wound up working in the chemical industry because I have a, my degree is in, is in microbiology. I have a lot of chemistry throughout school. And um, I was interested in, quote, you know, using my degree in some way, having right. suffered through it for four years, I thought, you know, probably sensible to try to use at least some of that information. Um, so I wound up by, by chance in some respects in the chemical industry and frankly speaking at that time, and I, I'm not going to admit to how long I've been out of school, but, but we'll leave it at that. But at the time that I left, the industry was quite um, staid. It wasn't particularly dynamic. Mm. Uh, there wasn't a lot of change. There was a, a real focus on commoditization across a whole different range of, of products. And of course, the industry had a, a reputation that was, um, you know, uh, let's say not stellar um, for, for some good reasons and some bad reasons. Um, uh, for me, it, it wasn't an industry that was as dynamic as I would have liked. And as a consequence, I, I at one point in my career began focusing on intellectual property based businesses and, and um, different business models such as uh, intellectual property licensing. I got very interested in the idea that, um, you know, IP or patents could actually be an asset of a company. That asset might be something that could be traded. Um, long story short, and in fact, um, at one point in my career, I left a very good job at Honeywell, working for within a very big chemical business um, to join a startup that was based in California. And um, I, I remember, you know, the, the 
let's say the experience of working in a startup was really quite exciting. And I, I in fact recall saying, you know, I've had the best day of my life and the worst day of my life on the same day. Um, you know, the highs and lows became somewhat, um, say addictive, but, but exciting and, and challenging. And, and so I've had an interest for a good long time in moving back into young growth companies. And um, yeah, ultimately that led me down a path to uh, joining Eden. Um, I, I think I was recruited primarily because I had both an IP licensing and a kind of more conventional business model background. Um, and ironically, not that long after I joined, we decided to change the business model because I, I wasn't convinced that licensing was really the right business model for us. I see. And so, um, long story short, but but that's how I wound up here. I, for me, the company represented one absolutely being at the right time in its in its development cycle. Mm -hmm. Timing is everything with startups. I think generally timing is everything in life, but. Um, with, with early stage growth businesses, um, timing is absolutely essential. Um, also, the company had gone through a very long sort of just gestation period um, whilst it was pursuing regulatory authorizations for its first active ingredients and products. And so, you know, I recognized that it, the company was approaching a, an inflection point, uh, to use an over, overused phrase. And um, for me, it was the convergence of three things that I loved. Um, you know, it was the convergence of, you know, microbiology and chemistry um, with industry and, 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 you know, commercial endeavors and, and food. Um, you know, I, I, I love food and uh, that might so be obvious. <laughs> yeah, that might be obvious after the, the, the lockdown period, but um, in any case, no, I, I, I love the idea of, you know, biology meets chemistry meets, meets, um, a food chain and so for me that the role was extremely attractive yeah i mean i think you're absolutely right the the work that you're doing at Re eden which we'll 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 talk about right now really is um i think it's it's very interesting to see how uh th what impact you're making because um well i mean really the first question um it, it kind of just dovetailing into it is um we've um what, as I was reading about Eden, um, I've discovered that there is something called intentionally added microplastics. And um, there, there are really two themes as we were talking about before we started recording to what Eden research focuses on. There's the microplastics side, and then of course there's the sustainable chemistry side. Um, I think the microplastics side is just, as I mentioned, it's absolutely shocking because when I hear microplastics, I think my shopping bag ends up in the ocean and then it breaks yeah. down because of sun and water, et cetera. Turns out actually that microplastics are intentionally used. Like you, people are actually taking advantage of the chemical properties, I suppose, of microplastics. Um, so what exactly, what, are, what, am, what am I even talking about here? What is intentionally <laughs> added microplastics? I, it's shocking to me. It, it, it is surprising. And, it, it, and in a sense, um, it was surprising to me as well, even, even with my background in, in the industry. Um, the short, the short version of it, and it is not just in crop protection or fertilizers, where where plastics are intentionally added to formulations to give some benefits, and I'll elaborate on those in a minute. But it's also if you look at household chemicals, laundry detergents, fabric conditioners, um, many consumer products contain microplastics, um, and and this isn't done. Um, for, for uh, the absence of a good reason. It's actually done for some very good reasons. Um, for our own products and, and in crop protection, what tends to happen is um, you, you are producing a product, which is a formulation. So you're using chemistry and, and you know, your knowledge of biology and chemistry in this particular case to develop a product that has a very specific formulation that's intended to do a very specific job. And within that formulation, you have what are called active ingredients. So um, an active ingredient, for example, in a pharmaceutical product is pretty easy to understand. People, people know what that is, that that's the drug that you're taking that does the job. Right. In crop protection, depending upon what kind of product you're talking about, it might be a fungicide or a compound that is fungicidal. So you're tackling plant diseases. Um, those active ingredients have different qualities, different characteristics. And it's not good enough just to know that that active ingredient does the job that you, you're designing it to do. But it's important that you get it into the system in a way that it's usable. 
And so there are issues. One of the issues is called bioavailability. In other words, you've got an active ingredient. It needs to be available to the biological system in order for it to have its effect. Um, if, you, if you think about it, you know, if you have a very insoluble material, um, it's very unlikely to be readily bioavailable. So therefore, you have to use more of it. Um, in the case of our active ingredients, the reason we use a microencapsulation technology is because our active ingredients are very, they're, they're, they're uh, not water loving, you know, they're very hydrophobic, they're like oils in water. Um, they're, they're very volatile, um, a bit like, you know, alcohol, for example, they, they volatilize in the environment. And that means obviously you're having to put more down in order to achieve the same effect. Um, and th there are some other issues as well. For example, um, in many cases, the active ingredients can cause harm um, when used in high concentrations to crops. So the irony for us is that we're using active ingredients that come from plants. We're packaging them up and we're putting them into a formulation, but actually in high levels of use, um, those can actually create some damage to the crop. And so, you know, we're managing all of those things. So in order to, to achieve a, a good, useful formulation, we and other people um, can take an approach which is called microencapsulation. So we're packaging these things up and we're putting them into a formulation that's then useful. Um, in the vast majority of cases, uh, microencapsulation systems are based on plastics or polymers. And so the vast majority of the applications in, in both fertilizers, uh, sustained release fertilizers in particular, um, and also uh, crop protection products is uh, that the, this is done using polymers. So the polymer basically forms during the manufacturing process and it encapsulates the active ingredient so you can control its release rate, you can improve its usability, you can improve its crop safety, you can make stable products, et cetera. So there are lots of reasons for this. So again, it, it goes back to the point, this isn't done for, for no good reason. Um, you know, in order to make the product work, in some cases you do have to microencapsulate and in the majority of cases that microencapsulation system is based on a polymer. Um, in our case, we've taken a very different approach, and, and um, that was partially driven by sustainability um, interests. So, you know, one has to ask oneself the question, why would a company develop products based on sustainable chemistry if you're not using a sustainable formulation approach? Um, and the other reason was because our microencapsulation system happens to work particularly well with the kind of chemistry that we work with, but also quite conveniently, it happens to work very well with some other third party chemistries as well, which is a real opportunity for us. Um, so I, I, I think that probably gets around in a long way, sorry, uh, to, to your answer. Well, that's so really interesting. So just to, to summarize from, to see if I, if I understand. So micro encapsulation is basically um, cause it, this is really my first time encountering this term. Um, it sounds like essentially what you're doing is you're taking chemicals that, um, are, I suppose, aren't very sticky maybe, um, or somehow react very intensely in the environment. And by encapsulating them, I mean, you're literally putting like a little shell over them and slowly releasing over a set period of time. That's exactly right. I mean, what it really boils down to is, you know, when you're designing a product, when you're developing a product to do a job, you know, it's partially about what active ingredient you're using to do right. that job. And it's partially about how you deliver that active ingredient in a product that's usable. And so the micro encapsulation approach is very much as you described, you're, you're creating a little, you know, little capsule to put the chemical in so that it, does its job effectively. And that's really what it comes down to. Interesting. So that I'm assuming when, cause I've seen like, um, I, I'm originally from California, which is why I sound the way I do. And uh, at least in the U S you see all these prescription, uh, these, you know, over the counter drugs. Um, obviously they're here in the UK too. I just remember more vividly in the, in the U S where it says like long lasting or, you know, this is, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, release slow releasing something like 24 hour period so that's using a micro encapsulation technology it's great it's a great example yeah slow release um uh, drug formulation right. um, can very much can use polymer based systems there, there are some different techniques that can be used um you know it, it's an overlooked 
art and science, the, the science of formulation. And, um, you know, it really what it really boils down to is producing usable products, whether they're pharmaceutical products mm -hmm. or whether they're, you know, shampoos and conditioners or, or you know, fabric conditioners, et cetera. And so um, there it is a very big field in industry and in medicine. Um, and again, it's all down to, you know, getting the job done. How do you produce a wow. product that actually works? So that's, um, I see. Yeah. So that, that's one of the two themes, as we mentioned, there's kind of the microplastics, which is actually more focused about this encapsulation technology rather than plastic specifically. Um, and there is huge, uh, uh, I suppose, opportunities there, because like you said, it, it works well with your, uh, sustainable chemistry for, um, I mean, I, in the first instance, it's the um, crop protection, which we'll talk about in a second. But what you're also saying is actually because there are these other uh, chemicals like animal health and consumer products, such as laundry detergent, it sounds like you can actually use that technology, uh, the microencapsulation technology, which does not use plastic across a wide variety of fields. Uh, absolutely. And, and if we stay focused on crop protection for one minute, yeah. Um, the, what we're doing, so we've solved this problem using a non-polymer based naturally derived system, right? So instead of using plastics to encapsulate these active ingredients, we're actually using, um, a form of yeast extract. So we're, we're, um, we're taking yeast cell walls and we're hollowing those out and we're using them as a way of delivering different active ingredients. But back to the point that you just made, um, what's nice is that this system doesn't just work with our active ingredients, it works with other people's active ingredients. And what that means is that we have an opportunity to work with other crop protection companies to encapsulate their active ingredients in a much more sustainable way. And, and that's even applicable if we're talking about conventional chemical pesticides that on the one hand we're competing with mm -hmm. with our you know biopesticide products that are based on natural chemistry but we feel that we can make an important contribution to sustainable agriculture by providing those conventional pesticide producers with a more sustainable way of delivering their conventional chemistry um, it's really all about getting the job done in the most sustainable way and you, you can either take a, a big step in that direction with purely sustainable chemistry with a very, very positive environmental profile and, and high levels of efficacy, or you can take a step in that direction and take the currently used conventional chemistry and, and help to improve its overall sustainability by getting away from polymer-based microencapsulation systems and using our uh, technology, which we've branded as Sustain with an E on it, um, which is a maybe an obvious play on sustainability but it, it's also a play on, there's no on, confusion there <laughs> yeah no no it, it's pretty it's pretty pretty blunt um but no but the it's also somewhat of a play on sustained release because of course one of the other reasons why you do microencapsulation as we we're just referring to in your example with sustained release drugs is about releasing those active ingredients over time mm -hmm. so that they have an opportunity to do their job more effectively um over time and, and there's ultimately a benefit to that as well, which means that those active ingredients can be applied in, in lower amounts. Yeah, um, well, that's fascinating. And I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's, um, I think it is, um, you, you can't always, sustainability in just in general, and, and I suppose this kind of goes to a lot of things in life, you can't just jump from zero to a hundred right away. Sometimes, yeah. Um, it, it's a step-by-step -step process. And of course, there's a lot of room for improvement in many fields as far in industries, as far as how we can become more sustainable. I think it's much better to uh, remove microplastics and um, continue using maybe some other chemistry that isn't as, um, I guess, environmentally friendly and move in the direction um of becoming a more sustainable solution and then from there you can iterate further and further and further and eventually the the chemistry itself or the actual um ingredients that you're using to protect crops will eventually become more sustainable the, the industry as a whole is moving toward more sustainable chemistry and that that doesn't just include ourselves but it includes you know people that are producing conventional chemicals as well right but i think we we all share the objective of giving farmers the tools that they need 
to feed the world, basically, mm -hmm. which sounds like a grandiose statement, but that, that is what they're doing. Yeah, probably, um, yeah. and, and to allow them to have the tools that they need to do that job effectively. And we collectively are moving toward a position where that is um, very much driven by improved sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so for, for Eden as a company, we are very much in the right place at the right time because public policy is changing rapidly. This is driven by consumer fears, which subsequently drive you know, uh, retail uh, buyers uh, toward more sustainable products which ultimately drive um, you know, growers to using those types of things on the basis that the regulatory regime changes. Right. Uh, regulations get more and more strict. Um, conventional chemistry products are removed from the market. And um, the alternatives that growers are left with are products like ours, which you know, have to be sustainable um, yeah. in order to meet the current and emerging regulatory requirements. Yeah. Absolutely makes sense. And so moving over to the second theme of, uh, of Eden, uh, we've covered the micro encapsulation, which we kind of, I started off by calling it really the microplastics side. Um, and now uh, you, you, you've mentioned that there's really two sides of, of Eden's business. Um, you have your tech, which can be, sounds like it can be licensed out to other industries and companies. And, and then there's your actual own, um, at least on the website, it's called biopesticides or bio, chemical um, mm -hmm. biochemistry that you use to protect plants. So when we're talking about crop protection, what, what, do I, what does that actually mean? Yeah, so, so Eden, um, the, the focus of the company in the very, very early days, which goes back some time now, was very much around sustainable chemistry and the view that um, nature gives us a lot of tools. We, we need to learn how to harvest or harness those tools. Um, and so um, the focus of the company in its earlier days was using plant-derived active ingredients to solve problems. Right. In the company's very early days, the, the then management team was very um, looking at a whole range of different applications. Um, so the, the basis of what we're doing is we are taking plant-derived essential oils and we're isolating some of the individual chemistry that's in those essential oils to deliver a benefit mm -hmm. and so um and i'll put it in simple terms because it's quite complex actually but please do <laughs> uh, yeah the 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 crops plants have their own immune systems and they, they respond to stresses um in a very very clear demonstrable way um and and the, the, there's a multitude of ways in which they do that but one of the things that they do is they produce these bioactive molecules that defend them from various threats, whether they're pests or disease or, or stresses of various kinds. And so what we did was we began to focus on a class of chemistry called terpenes. And you'll find terpenes in, in the environment. They're abundant in the environment. They're in the food that you eat day in and day out. Um, one of our active ingredients actually comes from clove oil. One of them comes from um, thyme oil. So the, the herb time. Um, so, the, you know, these active ingredients all come from plant derived essential oils. And we worked out that by basically developing products based on a combination of three of them, we can tackle a wide range of different problems, not just in crop protection uh, or agriculture, but also in human health, animal health, consumer products, etc. And so that, that's been um, the focus of our product development efforts. Our, our main focus is in sustainable agriculture, um, but we're working in animal health. We, we have a, a very good partner in the form of Bear Animal Health, uh, which is based in the U.S. Ironically, they're, they're based in the U.S. Um, where I grew up, which I also grew up in the U.S. Oh, cool. Uh, my, my accent has changed, obviously, over the years. I've been here, I was but, trying to place it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, well, I grew up in Kansas City. So, oh, but, wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't going to guess that, I'm guessing. But um, yeah, so, so we're working with those guys in Kansas City to develop um, products based on very similar chemistry to solve problems facing companion animals. Mm. Uh, and again, it's the same approach as taking plant-derived active ingredients, packaging them up using our micro-encapsulation technology so we can produce effective, efficient products um, and delivering them to treat dermatological disease, for example, on dogs. Wow. And exactly the same approach is being taken in consumer products where we're working with a few partners to develop products, uh, for example, that can treat head lice um, on children. Wow. Again, it's the same exact approach, taking plant-derived essential oils with all their active ingredients, packaging them up, 
formulating them into a product and delivering a product ultimately to the consumer that um, treats a, a very well-known product, but in a safe and, and effective way. So basically what, I mean, essentially the, the, the benefit of using these essential oils is that you're not, I mean, you're basically taking what's already available in nature. That's right. Um, rather than needing to create something from scratch that where we have no idea what the potential side effects are. Exactly. You know, in, in fairly simple terms, um, you know, when we develop products based on natural compounds, generally speaking, the, the environment and, and, you know, the, the kind of flora have developed ways in which to deal with those. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we don't have the kinds of persistence issues you have with some conventional chemistry um, that, you know, the, 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 the biome, if you will, hasn't adapted to, hasn't developed a way in which those compounds can be processed in the environment. And some compounds, uh, particularly some, some synthetic chemistry, can be extremely persistent in the environment. And, and, you know, we've heard of some very good examples, but DDT is a good example of that. You know, a product which has an extremely long uh, persistence in the environment, doesn't go away readily, mm. has to be treated in a very specific way to, to get rid of it. Natural compounds tend not to have that type of profile. Um, they do tend to have environmental fates that are very positive, that the routes to degradation are very clear and very well known. And so, and I, I don't want to overgeneralize, I am generalizing, but you know, there, there are always exceptions. But the point is that if we were to make a general rule about this, it would be to say that naturally derived chemistry tends to be uh, more sustainable in the sense that it has a better uh, uh, environmental fate. Yeah, well, that makes sense. And I think, um, as you're saying, you know, the, um, the fact that it's not as harmful and it, it is based on um, uh, kind of natural, not kind of, I mean, it is based on and you're using natural uh, chemicals allows for also post-harvest applications, which sounds to me like a, a relatively rare uh, opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't say it's rare. I mean, the, the, the industry is is um, well developed. So there, there are kind of um, at least anyway, two types of um, treatments that are developed to provide an improvement in um, shelf life, ultimately. Um, so minimizing food waste. One is the application of um, certain products such as ours in pre-harvest that then translates into a post-harvest benefit. I see. Um, in terms of extending shelf life, et cetera, reducing disease um, when products go into storage, et cetera, on the shelves. And then the other is a post-harvest treatment. Um, and we, we believe that our products probably have applicability there, but that's not the first area in which we're focused. Um, we're working with a couple of our partners in particular in France uh, and across Europe to look at um, the development of a product for post-harvest benefit that's applied prior to harvest. Hmm. Um, and in particular, we're pursuing that in France with our partner Sumiagro in France um, to develop basically uh, an improvement to post-harvest disease control. Um, a lot of people don't realize that when most apples, when they're picked um, for consumption um, as a fruit um, in the supermarkets by consumers, typically those apples go into storage. Um, most of them aren't sold as fresh. They, they literally go into storage. Um, and they go into storage in some cases for several months under controlled circumstances. And what tends to happen is the, the apples go into storage, the stores are closed up. Um, in that environment, if disease emerges, it is entirely possible that the um, farmer would open that store up and see that a large percentage of their crop uh, in storage has been attacked by various, um, primarily fungal uh, diseases that affect apples. And so um, as a consequence, what we've been doing is working with them to apply just before the time of harvest. Um, and that benefit then translates into mm. use and storage and, and reducing, um, basically reducing disease pressure. 
and yeah, and thereby reducing food waste, which is that's exactly right. Yeah, that's a huge uh, benefit. And actually, there's um, if you're familiar with Project Drawdown, which is um, like the hundred most effective solutions that we currently have to reverse uh, climate change. Yeah. Um, very recently, this uh, project has uh, announced that the number one most effective solution we have to reversing climate change is basically reducing food waste. Okay. So. Yeah these kind of applications, I, I mean, it has huge implications. Um, so. it, it, they, they have huge economic implications as well. I well, mean, exactly. You, you, yeah. can, you can imagine a farmer spending an entire season tending a crop, fertilizing it, looking after it, treating it to prevent insect infestations and disease, etc. cetera, mm. um, getting to the end, harvesting, you know, thinking this is fantastic. I, I, you know, I've got money in the bank. They put the food into storage and it, and it goes off. Um, you know, this is a this is a massive issue um, for farmers as well. So it's all about you know productive agriculture that's also sustainable from our perspective. Yeah, I uh, completely agree. And um, as we're as we're coming to a close here, I'm, one one question that I think you know people who may be listening to this and certainly me as an individual is there anything that we can do just like as me daniel hanging out and going to the supermarket is there anything that we can do to support your work and to encourage either farmers or other producers along the supply chain to uh you know use these more natural uh solutions yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are a few things. Um, you know, first off, maybe I'll start off with the one that comes to my mind first. But you know, when when people are looking to support companies like Eden um, and 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 our our partners who are developing sustainable solutions for problems that, that face mankind as a whole, um, you know, we're we're day in and day out making investment decisions and looking at companies and who we should invest our our hard earned money into. And so I would encourage people to, you know, really understand where their investment dollars or pounds are going um, and to wherever possible to invest in companies like Eden when there's an opportunity to do so to support their work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're a listed company and as a consequence, you know, if you're investing your funds, you, you might make some decisions about what kind of companies you do and don't want to support. And, um, you know, as you mentioned at the onset, you know, we're the only uh, listed company in the UK that is actually focused on sustainable agriculture. Um, in, a, in a more direct way, um, you know, people can insist that they understand you know, the kind of the provenance of the, of the food that they're eating, um, that they, they talk to their retailers and they say, well, look, I, I want more sustainable crops. I want to understand how things are grown. I want to understand, you know, what pesticide residues are there on these crops. Um, one of the things that we really benefit from and our partners benefit from is the fact that um, all of our products are based on active ingredients that are exempt from maximum residue limits in the EU. And what that means is that farmers don't need to be concerned about the time at which they apply our product um, prior to harvest. They don't need to be concerned about residue reporting or any of the audits that take place for them because again, we're exempt from these residue limits, which is, which is really useful, you know, really for consumers as well. I mean, in the first instance, it's useful for farmers, but that translates very directly into a benefit for consumers. Uh, and, and, you know, we also are, are quite lucky in the sense that our, our active ingredients have recently been allowed in the EU as inputs for organic agriculture. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you know, whilst we, we supply into the conventional growers and the organic growers now, um, you know, having consumers that are well aware of what they're eating, how it's grown, what the standards are, is extremely useful. And having them lobby their retailers, uh, their, their supermarkets, for the products that meet the standards that they expect is you know, very useful for companies like us who are focused on sustainability and for of course the farmers who are focused on sustainable solutions yeah I, I think that's all all great points and i think it's um it's one of those things where sometimes you feel like you may not have enough sway just because you're one person at a huge supermarket somewhere uh, and actually i think you and this is kind of a theme that i'm, I'm constantly pushing the more and more I realize is that we actually as individuals have sometimes the most sway because ultimately, uh, as you're saying, farmers are growing food to feed the world and the world is made up of individual people. So if, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, 
you know, and I, I, it goes back to a point that you made earlier on, which is, you know, progress towards sustainability isn't necessarily one massive leap, mm. but it's a series of smaller steps. And so just as we're helping conventional pesticide manufacturers improve the sustainability of their products by removing microplastics from their formulations, you know, we, we can all take small steps toward a much more sustainable um, agriculture and in general industry. Um, and, and, you know, people as individuals have a certain voice. Uh, we also have a voice as, as employees of companies. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we can share that vision uh, with the leadership of the companies that we work for to say, you know, sustainability is important to us. So it's, it's small steps every day and, and you know, waiting for the big, uh, for the big leap, for the big innovation, for the big, you know, sea change, if you will, is probably going to produce a result that none of us like. So if we start every day and we take a small step every day and then we, we look to take two the next day, et cetera, um, I think that's how we'll collectively see progress towards a, a sustainable industry, a sustainable agriculture and, and general sustainability for all of us. Yeah, indeed. And those kind of like 1% changes every day or every week are actually sustainable just to use that word one more time, because yeah. then we, um, you know, we're not making big changes that we can't keep up with. Um, yeah, it's a very optimistic, great way to, uh, to end. Um, yeah. Thank you for the, for the ins inspiration. So Sean, where, um, where can people learn more about you or, or Eden research if they're interested in, in, uh, learning about the, the sustain product and micro encapsulation, as well as, the terpenes and the um, the natural essential oil derivatives that you're using. No, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, the, the main uh, source for detailed information on us is generally our website, which is just www.edenresearch.com. Um, as a as a listed company, there's quite a lot of information on there: annual reports, um, company history, summaries of what we're doing, etc. News updates. Um, there's quite a lot there. We're also quite active on Twitter, on LinkedIn, etc. So, so either about me or the company, you can find information on a lot of those sources. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you very much for your time today, Sean. Wonderful to hear about the work that you're doing. And uh, I think the fact that you have these two lines of business, which are complementary and at the same time, allow you other companies to carry on their journey of sustainability. Uh, I think it's fantastic and it's very important. So thank you for, for the work that you're doing as well. Thanks, Dan. I really appreciate your interest and um, you know, the discussion. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, give us a five-star rating. And also, please subscribe, whether on your podcast app or on YouTube. And that way you can be the first to know about new episodes. Thank you very much and talk to you soon.